Anne, are you ready? Yes. All you. <clears throat> Hello, everybody in cyberspace. <clears throat> I'm Anja Clard of Marxist Humanist Initiative. Welcome to part one of Marxist Humanist Initiative's two-part class on Henrik Grossman's breakdown model and breakdown theory. The second part will be held in two weeks on October 8. MHI, as we're called, <clears throat> is sponsoring these classes because we believe in the widest possible discussion and debate about Marxism as a way to further its development and provide theoretical resources to workers in mass movements. After 94 years, Grossman's breakdown theory continues to have a grip on many purported Marxists, both activists and academics. But Andrew Kleiman's writings make a very strong case that, far from Grossman having added to Marxist theory with his model, he instead contradicts Marxist theories and enables people to draw fatalistic conclusions about overcoming capitalism. If this is the case, then Grossman created one more hurdle in thought that revolutionary masses have to overcome in order to release their own power and creativity. So it is our duty, we believe, to examine it. You can find material about this class series and links to the articles under discussion on our website, which is www.marxisthumanistinitiative.org slash our publication. Andrew Kleiman will be leading the classes. Andrew is Professor Emeritus of Economics at Pace University in New York and the author of these books, Reclaiming Marxist Capital, A Refutation of the Myth of Inconsistency, and The Failure of Capitalist Production, Underlying Causes of the Great Recession. He's also written dozens of journal articles and other peer-reviewed publications, and he writes often for With Sober Senses, the online publication of Marxist Humanist Initiative. So welcome to all of you out there and welcome, Andrew. Uh, thank you very much, Anne. Um, welcome to everybody. Uh, MHI host, can you put the uh, URL in the chat uh, that Anne mentioned? Roger that. Okay. Um, so first, I want to begin with some preliminary points. Uh, on that, in the article that Ann mentioned, uh, there's just a brief outline of the main points of this first class. Uh, there's also a timeline of authors and their works that I'll be discussing in this class. Uh, I can't keep flipping back and forth uh, to that. Um, but in any case, uh, what we're going to have in this uh, class is, you know, you'll see my video, that of the discussants, uh, you'll be able to hear us, uh, but other participants uh, for purposes of minimizing trolling and just because we're not that used to it, uh, all other participants, uh, the way that you're going to communicate is just in the chat in written form. And so what you should do, if you haven't already, is at the bottom of your Zoom screen, there are a bunch of icons, one of which says chat. It's a little chat balloon. Click on it, and uh, a chat uh, window should appear to the right of the Zoom screen. If you have to click got it or something, uh, if there's a message at the top, do that in the middle of yeah, in the middle of the, the, uh, the chat screen are the messages. The most recent ones are at the bottom. And if you want to uh, be heard, you know, if you want to write a message, you do that at the very bottom, right below the um, little lozenge that says MHI host. So you're going to write to the MHI host, and the MHI host will then um, forward 
to everybody uh, your, your message. So uh, I'm going to present for about an hour, and, and then there will be comments from today's discussants, Alan Freeman and Esteban Mora. And then the floor is going to be open to all of your questions as well as all of your comments uh, about Marx's crisis theory, uh, Grossman's crisis theory, my October 21 article on Grossman and other things I've written about his theory, uh, and of course about you know my presentation today and the discussions comments today. Uh, please don't ask questions or make comments about other things than that. That's already a lot. And in addition, if you have questions during my presentation about something I've just said, you don't have to wait till the second hour to ask them. Post your questions uh, in the chat while I'm speaking, and I hope to check the chat a few times during my presentation. And if I get questions that ask me to clarify something specific that I've just said, I, I do hope to answer them during the presentation, you know, while it's still fresh, so we can have a bit of a dialogue. Okay, uh, one main purpose uh, in these classes uh, is of mine, one of my main purposes is to get people to take Marx's theory of economic crisis seriously, Marx's own theory. Um, there's a lot of Grossmanism out there, a lot of fatalism and, and so forth. But actually, you know, what I discovered is that there's relatively little understanding of or interest in Marx's own uh, theory of capitalist economic crisis. Uh, people say, and maybe they think that they subscribe to Marx's theory, uh, but mostly what they're talking about is Grossman's theory or something derived from Grossman's theory rather than Marx's theory. Uh, another of my main purposes in these classes is to clarify and call attention to uh, the analysis of Grossman's model and theory that's in my October 21 article. Uh, I think it demonstrated results that were new and important. Uh, in particular, it demonstrated that a long-term tendency toward a Grossman-style economic breakdown, in other words, breakdown due to insufficient profit to keep capital accumulating at the postulated rate, okay, that is not compatible with Marx's value theory. Um, if technological progress causes commodities values to fall in the way that Marx's theory says it does, the breakdown tendency simply goes away. Uh, but some people have had difficulty understanding my analysis uh, and the demonstrations in it. Uh, so I want to clarify them in these classes. Uh, and I also want to call attention to my article because it's gotten a lot less attention than I think it warrants. Uh, with the exception of Ted Reese, who recently wrote a book on Grossman, all of the main devotees of Grossman's theory have declined to discuss, you know, my work uh, on this publicly, although they've been invited to do so. Uh, they've been acting as if my analysis and demonstrations uh, don't exist. And that brings me to my third purpose, which is the needed regime of truth. Uh, Michel Foucault talked about regime of truth, and he didn't mean what I mean. Um, I mean, regime of truth, right? Uh, and so it's good if you learn things from these classes. Uh, and I'm also not against you agreeing with me, if you can justify why you agree, but your learning and your agreement is not going to turn around this disappearing of marks that they do. In this case, a lot of other cases. And that it's not going to turn around the lack of concern for truth that pervades radical intellectual discourse and almost everything else these days. Okay, we need a regime of truth and we need to fight for it. And so I need you. Okay, uh, another preliminary point I wanna make, the final one uh, is that to understand Grossman's work in his 1929 book, I think it's important to distinguish between his model and his theory. Okay, let me clarify what I mean by the difference. He was a big fan of working in two stages. First stage, you make simplifying assumptions, you draw conclusions that depend on those assumptions. And that's what a model is, a bunch of assumptions that give you a simplified representation of something, and then the conclusions that these assumptions lead to. That was his first stage. Then the second stage, 
you relax the assumptions. You slip them a value. No, no, you don't slip them a value. Relaxing the assumptions means weakening them, getting rid of some, making them less stringent. Okay, so you relax the assumptions, you draw revised conclusions in light of these second stage modifications. So what I mean by Grossman's model is the first stage. And by Grossman's theory, I mean the second stage. And if you work in that way that he worked, you draw conclusions in the first stage based on your model simplifica simplifications and the assumptions, you draw conclusions that you don't really believe. So I think it's best to, not to say that the model or the conclusions based on the model are part of the actual theory. Okay, um, so specifically, I'm going to use the term Grossman's model to refer to the scheme of expanded reproduction that he took over from Otto Bauer. Uh, Grossman was very critical of that scheme, but he used it as his first stage, and he, he drew conclusions from it that he thought were, however, too simplistic. Uh, Grossman made only one major change in Bauer's assumptions. Uh, Bauer's scheme has two departments of production, production of means of production, production of consumption goods. For Grossman's purposes, that was an unnecessary complication, uh, and he mostly just considered the total economy. So he had, in essence, a one-sector total economy model. Uh, there's three main chapters in his 29 book. Uh, chapter one is relatively short for him. Uh, a relatively short review of what previous authors had said about the downfall of capitalism. Chapter two is about a third of the book, and that presents and discusses the model, the reproduction scheme. Chapter three is called Modifying, modifying Counter Tendencies, and that develops Grossman's full fledged theory by modifying the model. And that takes up about half the book. And more than half of chapter three is about so-called absolute overaccumulation and imperialist expansion, which are related topics for him. However, chapter two is not just the model and chapter three is not just the theory. There were reviews of prior literature and polemics all throughout the book on point after point. Okay, I wanna to come to the uh, heart of, my presentation. Uh, the first point is I want to talk about reproduction and accumulation, the terminology involved and the relations involved, just so we're all on the same page. Um, terms that we're going to be using. Capital. A uh, quick and easy, and I think serviceable definition of capital is that it is money that is not spent, but it's money that's invested, okay? The idea is you spend, that's once and for all, goes away. The investment, at least the investor hopes that it doesn't go away, but it comes back together with some profit. So if you put out some money, hoping that you're gonna get it back plus profit, then that uh, expenditure is, it, it's not really an expenditure, it's an investment and that's a capital expenditure. Okay, now in Marxist theory, there are two kinds of capital, plain and peanut. No, uh, there's constant capital, let me just, And there is variable capital. Um, and so they're both money invested, but the constant capital is invested to purchase means of production, raw materials, tools, machinery. Um, and Marx says this is constant because the amount of value that's invested reappears in the products. 
Um, but it doesn't undergo any change in magnitude. You know, hundred dollars in, hundred dollars out. Uh, with the variable capital, that is money that is invested uh, in order to hire workers. Okay, pay their wages and pay their benefits. And this amount of value that's invested reappears in the product together with a surplus. Okay, some extra value that Marx calls surplus value. Okay, now the way I presented it here, and I think it's correct, notice that the primary definitions are all about money. They're all about value. They're not about physical things, okay? So cost and capital, an amount of money invested in means of production, variable capital, an amount of money that's invested to hire workers. There are derivative definitions. They cause confusion. You know, if you're sloppy and you're just writing and you haven't prepared for publication, people often refer to the means of production uh, as constant capital. And they refer to uh, the, the workers' labor power as variable capital, sometimes, not often. Okay. Um, but I'm going to try to stick to the primary money definition uh, of all of this here because the distinction between constant capital uh, and means of production distinction between variable capital and workers' labor power, um, that will be important. Okay. Uh, let me turn to now accumulation of capital and uh, reproduction of capital. Okay, I want to begin with the price of a product. It could be the value of the product or a price that differs from the product, it doesn't matter. Uh, and this can be broken down into the cost of the production. plus the profit. And here profit refers to the profit that the you know, business itself keeps, the dividends that they pay the shareholders, the interest that they pay the lenders, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, all, all of that. Now, the costs of production get recouped in the price of the product. Okay, so the, Firm lays out for costs the price of the product. When they sell, they get the price. That recoups the cost of production. So it recovers the used up C. What is C? C is that constant capital. And it recovers. V, what's V? V is that variable count. Okay. Um, the profit, here's where we get into accumulation and, and reproduction. The profit can be used in basically two ways. Marx makes this um, distinction. It's an obvious distinction. Uh, volume one of uh, capital with each chapter 24. Well, the profit gets divided somehow between capital. So that 
That's where the capital comes in, okay? And so some of the profit of this period becomes capital in the next period, okay? It becomes money that's invested. Whatever part is not capital, is revenue, okay? And people often refer to the revenue as capitalist consumption. Grossman does that, all kinds of people do that, but that's only actually one part of the revenue. Okay? Because, I mean, you know, the, the, the capitalists buy stocks and bonds, and they don't eat them, they don't consume them. Okay, so we've got financial investment, saving, and, and, and so forth. And, and the, one reason that I'm drawing attention to this is that's investment, but it's not the capital of the business, okay? Even though it's an investment, I say the capital is an investment, but this is the personal investment of the owners. Okay, so that, that's not what we mean by, by investment here. When we talk about investment here, we don't mean the owner's financial investment, we mean their investment in, in production. Okay. So then we move to the next period. Okay, in the next period, there is again a C. If you want, we can put a prime symbol there. Uh, and there's a V. And if you want, we can put a prime symbol there to distinguish that from the original. Okay, now, um, the capital, as we know, all capital is either plain or peanut. So it's either Extra C, or it's extra V, and some will be some of one, some will be some of the other. Okay, so what is accumulation or capital accumulation? It's this. the accumulation of capital, exactly that, taking profit, turning it into productive capital. That's what accumulation is. Okay, so what happens then is In this next period, the uh, used up constant capital sum of value that's recovered, that becomes part of the new C, okay? Also, there was only, you know, used up C. There's still some C over here that wasn't used up. Okay, this unused C becomes part of the new C and this extra C becomes part of the new C. Okay, so that's the accumulation of constant capital. 
And in the same way, what's the new V? Well, the money that was recovered from selling the product, that's part of it. And then the capitalized or accumulated extra V. And this unused C is the end of year or end of period, I should say, end of period fixed capital. Okay, so notice that again, as I've been talking about everything in terms of money and value, so too with accumulation. Okay, so the accumulation is the capitalization of profit, using it to increase one's investment, basically. And then we get Reproduction, which is closely related but different, the primary sense in which Marx uses the term reproduction has to do with physical or material production, not, not with value. So the basic idea is you got to go back to where you started in terms of the material prerequisites for capitalist production. You had some means of production, they got used up, you gotta reproduce them, they gotta go in the right place. There were some workers, okay? They gotta be rehired, maybe some additional ones, and they gotta be reproduced as rightless proletarians who have you know, no means of production uh, of, of their own, and so forth and so on. So reproduction is a matter of getting from here to there, renewing the conditions for uh, capitalist production from period to period. And like everything here, it comes into flavors. There's simple reproduction, and that means there's no growth. The same amount of means of production that were used in the first period are used in the second period. They're just renewed. Uh, and then there is what Marx calls expanded reproduction. And that's where you've got growth. So here, if you got some extra C, well, probably it's been used to buy additional means of production. And with that, you're going to get some growth, especially because there's going to be some extra V, you're going to hire some additional workers. So the additional means of production, the additional workers are going to expand the volume of output production. So you'll have expanded reproduction. Okay, let me see if there's any comments or questions in the chat. Uh, none yet, okay. So I'm going to move on. Um, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, what I want to do now is uh, briefly uh, talk about uh, Marx's and Grossman's crisis theories um, and begin before them with Adam Smith and David Ricardo, classical economists. Uh, these classical economists held that the rate of profit uh, profit as a percentage of the amount of money invested 
in production or capital, uh, they held that it tends to fall in the long run. And uh, Smith inferred the fall of in the rate of profit from evidence that interest rates had fallen. Sees that interest rates have fallen, he says, ah, that it's got to mean that the rate of profit also falls. Why? Because, well, the rate of profit and interest rates are going to move uh, in the same direction. Then comes Marx. Pay attention to what I don't say about Marx's crisis theory, because that's as important as what I do say. Um, Marx accepted the classical economists had established the fact that the rate of profit tends to fall, but he rejected their explanations for why it falls. Uh, he said that it had been a mystery until his own law of the tendential fall in the rate of profit, why it falls. So he wasn't the first person to assert that the rate of profit falls, but he took credit for being the first to offer a law or explanatory theoretical principle that successfully explains the fact that it tends to fall. And Marx repeatedly called this the most important law of political economy. And it was developed in uh, part three of volume three of his work Capital. And very briefly, the law says that the rate of profit tends to fall because of mechanization, uh, rising, um, because of labor-saving technical change that increases productivity. And so when productivity, the amount of product per unit of labor increases, less labor is needed to produce a product. So it can be produced more cheaply. And so the product's value falls, and as a result, its price tends to fall. And when prices tend to fall, so do profits and the rate of profit. Uh, Marx recognized that there are various counteracting tendencies that tend to offset the fall in the rate of profit, so the law only operates as a tendency. Uh, and in principle, you know, abstractly speaking, the counteracting tendencies could be stronger or even stronger than the tendency. So the rate of profit could rise or remain stable. But remember that Marx regarded the falling tendency of the rate of profit as a fact. So he thought that in reality, the tendency happens to be stronger than the counteracting tendencies. And Marx was also the first person to link the fallen rate of profit to economic downturns and crises. Smith and Ricardo wrote before the era of recurrent economic downturns. Uh, and in their view, what ha happened when the rate of profit fell? Well, they said, you know, Profit's just going to dry up, go down to zero. And so what they envisioned was an eventual stationary state or no growth economy. They imagined, you know, just simple reproduction uh, at the end of the day. Um, as the capitalist opportunities to get additional profit diminish, so were their willingness to undertake additional productive investment. And so the economy would then go into a stationary state. Uh, Marx disagreed with that, and I'm going to start to share my screen. Please let me know when you can see my screen. We can see it. Okay. So Marx disagreed with what uh, Smith in particular said. Uh, Marx argued that the tendency for the rate of pro profit to fall produces boom and bust cycles. Um, in the theories of surplus value, he talked about Smith's view of the so-called overabundance of capital money capital that could be invested in production, but that isn't being invested because it's not profitable. And Marx said, when Smith explains the fall in the rate of profit as stemming from an overabundance of capital, he's speaking of a permanent effect, and that's wrong. Uh, as against this, the transitory overabundance of capital, overproduction, and crises are something different. Permanent crises do not exist. And in Marx's view, the permanent crises don't exist because 
The financial crises and the downturns, recessions, depressions that result from the fall in the rate of profit, those crises restore profitability. They cause a portion of the capital value that's invested in production to be destroyed by bankruptcies, writing off bad debt, falling prices, idle plant and equipment, and all, all kinds of things. So new owners can come in, acquire businesses cheaply and without assuming all of the previous owners' debts, which makes their rate of profit, the new owners, profit as a percentage of their reduced capital investment greater than the pre-existing rate of profit. So this destruction of capital value eventually leads to a restoration of the rate of profit and a new boom, a new phase of capitalist expansion. Now, in Marx's view, the fall in the rate of profit is only an indirect cause of the financial crises and the downturns. He did recognize that the fall in the rate of profit reduces capitalists' willingness to invest, but he said that the immediate causes of downturns are these financial crises, and he attributed them to debt that can't be repaid because profitability has declined, uh, and to an increase in speculation and fraudulent behavior that occurs when the rate of profit falls. Capitalists are all of a sudden scrambling around for profit, and they're going to do whatever, um, you know, engage in fraud, engage in too much speculation. Uh, Okay, so I want to br very briefly compare Marx's crisis theory with that of Grossman. Okay, and the first point is the rate of profit tends to fall. Um, Bauer adopted th this basic idea, constant capital grows faster than variable capital and surplus value, the rate of profit tends to fall. Bauer adopted that, so it became part of Grossman's model and his full-fledged theory. Why the rate of profit falls actually in Grossman is a, another matter, but they, Marx and Grossman both said the rate of profit tends to fall. But the role of the falling rate of profit is very different. Okay, As we just saw for Marx, the falling rate of profit is an indirect cause of crises and downturns. In Grossman, both his model and his theory the fall in the rate of profit is just a byproduct of the accumulation process. It's not a cause of breakdowns or of crises and downturns. Okay, Both of them did say that there are recurrent crises and downturns. So that's another point of commonality. Uh, but if you didn't listen to me talking about Marx's theory of breakdown, that's because there isn't any. Um, but there certainly is in Grossman. He says there's a tendency to breakdown, that tendency leads to crises and downturns, and he even talked about a final breakdown of the system. He didn't say that it would happen, but he de definitely said that there was a tendency to the final breakdown as a consequence of overaccumulation. Okay, what about the amount, absolute amount, or mass of profit? Marx said it can and must rise over time. Grossman didn't really disagree with that, but he focused on an insufficiency or alleged insufficiency in the mass of profit. He says it becomes insufficient to fund accumulation at its current pace. And that is the key cause of breakdown tendency, uh, crises and downturns. And he also focused on the uh, profit that's kept as personal income, this revenue. He put a lot of emphasis on revenue. Um, and he says that this revenue falls as accumulation accelerates, and that triggers the crises and downturns. And then we come to this issue of absolute overaccumulation of capital, which basically means just the capitalists invest more capital, but they don't get any extra profit because of that. Uh, Marx didn't have a theory of absolute accumulation. He had a thought experiment. I'll come to that in a moment. But Grossman said, yeah, there is absolute uh, overaccumulation of capital. And he, you know, about a quarter of his book is about imperialist expansion. And he attributed it to absolute overaccumulation at home, making imperialist uh, expansion necessary. 
Let me say a bit more about this absolute overaccumulation. Uh, volume three, chapter 15 of Capital, Marx talked about our absolute overaccumulation, but it was not as a theory. It was what he called the most extreme assumption that might be made. Uh, and it was a thought experiment to help understand overaccumulation of capital as such. He wrote, overproduction of capital is nothing more than overaccumulation of capital. To understand what this overaccumulation is, we have only to take it as an absolute. When would the overproduction of capital be absolute? Okay, that, that's the, the, the role that absolute overaccumulation plays, thought experiment. Uh, also, in the same discussion of absolute overaccumulation, uh, Marx wrote, if capital is sent abroad, this is not because it absolutely could not be employed at home. So there is not, in fact, absolute overaccumulation. It is rather because it can be employed abroad at a higher rate of profit. Uh, the uh, economist Varga, who was Stalin's economist, later wrote, Capital is exported not because it is absolutely impossible to accumulate domestically without thrust into non-capitalist markets, but because there is a prospect of higher profits elsewhere. Very close paraphrase of what Marx wrote. But Grossman, in his book, says Varga's conception is untenable. It was precisely Marx who proved that unlimited capitalist investment in a particular country is impossible and who identified the conditions under which absolute overaccumulation of capital and therefore also the compulsion to export capital arise. Okay? It's not higher profits abroad, but the lack of possibilities for investment at home that's the ultimate cause of capital exports. So he attributed what Marx said to Varga and exempted Marx. Okay, I've got uh, one chat question, two words, circulating capital. Um, this portion that isn't used doesn't circulate, okay? It just reappears next year as part of the next year's uh, constant capital. The rest of that capital circulated, okay? So it becomes part of the price of the product, okay? And it's recovered, okay? So it's circulating. It was invested, but then it gets recovered. Okay, uh, let me, so whenever you have fixed capital, it's, it's not circulating. So whenever a portion of capital is unused, you got fixed capital, okay? The rest is circulating. If there's no unused capital, then it's all circulating. Okay, I wanna come now to the breakdown controversy that uh, Grossman kind of came at the tail end of, but perpetuated. And to understand the breakdown controversy, you have to understand the revisionist controversy. Um, and we begin with Edward Bernstein. He was a prominent member of the Social Democratic Party of Germany, friend of uh, Frederick Engels. And in the second half of the 1890s, Bernstein started to argue publicly for sweeping revisions of socialist theory and practice. And his position became known as revisionism. Uh, he said that the direction of capitalism's development had turned out to be contrary in key respects to what Marx had predicted, or according to him, Marx had predicted. Um, class divisions were not becoming sharper, social reforms were improving workers' lives, uh, and the idea that, quote, we have to expect shortly a collapse of the bourgeois economy, that was wrong, according to Grossman. Excuse me, according to Bernstein. Bernstein advocated fighting to reform capitalism not as a path towards social revolution, but instead of social revolution. And in his book, uh, which is an English evolutionary socialism, he also criticized Marx's value theory, 
Marx's alleged economic determinism, the Hegelian influence on social democratic thought and various other things. The breakdown controversy was one aspect of this revisionist controversy. Bernstein not only rejected the idea that breakdown or collapse of the capitalist economy was coming soon, he claimed that belief in such a collapse was standard party doctrine. And he eventually suggested that Marx put forward a theory of breakdown as well in the Communist Manifesto and in Capital. Now, um, the standard socialist thinking that Bernstein imposed Standard socialist thinking that Bernstein opposed held that socialism is an imminent economic necessity. Uh, and Bernstein managed to interpret this as an implicit claim that the breakdown of capitalism is unavoidable on purely economic grounds. Um, but what exactly did he mean by economic grounds or for purely economic reasons? Well, the maturity of the proletarians, no, that's not economic, that's ethical, according to Bernstein. What about the power of the proletarian class? No, you know, that's uh, political, that's not economic, according to Bernstein. The general indignation over the planned cartel economy, well, that's not purely economic either, according to Bernstein. So it's pretty clear that when Bernstein means, you know, talks about a purely economic breakdown, he's talking about a mechanical breakdown, having nothing to do with the thoughts or feelings uh, or activity of working people. Uh, now, what about Bernstein's charges as a whole? Some of them seem to me to result from his pension for bundling together different ideas that he didn't like. Okay, he didn't like him in an economic necessity, so that gets turned into purely economic breakdown somehow. And where Marx foresaw the downfall of capitalism due to social revolution, the expropriators are expropriated. Bernstein just thought of this as a prediction of this purely economic breakdown. And here's what Marx wrote in the next to the last chapter of volume one of Capital. We're going to see this passage figure again and again. Expropriation is accomplished through the centralization of capitals. One capitalist always strikes down many others. Lots of bad stuff happening. But with this grows the revolt or indignation. Impulung is the German expression. It can mean revolt. It can mean indignation. But with this, there also grows the impulung, the revolt, indignation, of the working class, which is constantly increasing in numbers and trained, united, and organized by the capitalist process of production. The centralization of means of production, socialization of labor, they become incompatible with their capitalist, capitalist integument or shell. The expropriators are expropriated. So capitalist production begets with the inexorability of a natural process in its own negation. Okay, Bernstein said, well, there's a purely economic collapse. Uh, but Bernstein was answered in 1899 uh, by Karl Kautsky, who was the leading theorist of both the German Social Democratic Party and the worldwide movement. And Kautsky said, look, Bernstein has invented this term breakdown theory. Uh, a special or distinct breakdown theory was not put forward by Marx and Engels. And if you look at the party's uh, official pronouncements, you know, Bernstein can search in vain. He's not going to find a claim that bears any resemblance to the breakdown theory he put forward. Uh, and right at the same time, uh, Lenin reviewed Kautsky's book um, and he didn't publish it at the time, but he said, Kautsky deals with the so-called breakdown theory, sudden crash of Western European capitalism that Marx allegedly believed to be inevitable and connected with a gigantic economic crisis. Kautsky says and proves that Marx and Engels never propounded a special breakdown theory. They did not connect the breakdown necessarily with an economic crisis. This is a distortion chargeable to their opponents. Okay, 
That was Lenin's view. However, even before Kautsky answered Bernstein, Rosa Luxemburg had already done so. And in her book, Social Reform or Revolution, which was also published right around 1899, she claimed that the theory of breakdown, this purely economic breakdown, was indeed part of standard socialist theory. And she endorsed breakdown theory. She wrote, socialist theory up to now uh, declared that the point of departure for transformation to socialism would be a general and catastrophic crisis. Capitalism, as a result of its own inner contradictions, mo moves toward a point where it will be unbalanced, simply become impossible. The scientific basis of socialism rests, as is well known, on three principal results of capitalist development. First, on the growing anarchy of capitalist economy, leading inevitably to its ruin. But Bernstein pulls away from this when he says that capitalist development does not lead to a general economic collapse. Okay, uh, at that point in 1899, Bern, uh, Luxembourg did not yet have a fully worked out breakdown theory, uh, but she filled the gap in 1913 with her book, The Accumulation of Capital. She examined the expansion of capitalism, expanded reproduction, uh, in a hypothetical case, there are capitalist economies that experience continuous technological progress and accumulation of capital fuels economic growth. But in this hypothetical case, the economies are closed, okay, which means they lack access to foreign markets. And Luxembourg argued that these closed economies would inevitably break down and for a purely economic reason. The additional output that they would be producing as a result of accumulation, that additional output could not be sold at home internally. To sell all of the output internally, businesses would increasingly have to buy and sell to each other rather than to people, so-called consumers. Okay, but no problem. <laughs> Luxembourg dismissed that idea as fantastical, that the capitalists are buying and selling to other capitalist businesses. So in her view, the reason capitalist breakdown had not yet occurred was that capitalist economies did have access to foreign markets. And that last point, that's the core of her theory of imperialism. Uh, Luxembourg was answered almost immediately by Otto Bauer a uh, prominent Austro-Marxist theorist, uh, and in a review of Luxembourg's book, also published in 1913, he challenged the central claim that the additional output could not be sold internally. He developed a scheme of expanded reproduction to demonstrate that Luxembourg was wrong, and he tracked the economy's evolution through the first four years of his scheme. And throughout this four-year period, he showed the economy did not break down, it did not need foreign markets to prevent breakdown. The entire annual output was sold internally. And so what Bauer concluded is there's no breakdown. There's no breakdown tendency. Capitalism, he said, will not founder on mechanical impossibility of realizing surplus value. It will be brought down by the growing indignation of the working class, constantly increasing, schooled, united, and organized by the mechanism of the capitalist production process itself. Quoting Marx, um, Luxembourg was not impressed. Uh, in 1915, she responded to Bauer at great length in her anti-critique, and she dismissed his demonstration, arguing that Bauer's scheme, like Marx's, was fantastical because, again, it implies that businesses that, that businesses increasingly buy and from and sell to each other rather than to consumers. Uh, and the breakdown controversy kind of ended there probably because of the outbreak of World War, Luxembourg wrote her anti-critique from prison. Uh, but Grossman raised the breakdown controversy from the dead in 1929. Um, he endorsed the way Bernstein had framed the issue, and he endorsed Bernstein's idea that imminent economic necessity means purely economic breakdown. Okay. He said Bernstein was correct about this and entirely in accord with Marx. And he said 
are absolute unsurpassable economic limits to capital accumulation. Okay, and then the same passage he refers to. The idea that capitalist production begets with the inexorability of a natural process its own negation, that was already enunciated in the first volume of Capital. Okay, but then there's some criticism of Marx. Uh, Grossman says, Marx did not explicitly state how this negating tendency works itself out, how it has to lead to the breakdown of capitalism and the immediate causes that bring about the economic downfall uh, of the system. And he says, okay, that's volume one, but in volume three, it's not any better. Okay, you got the law of the initial fall and rate of profit, but is that a symptom of the breakdown tendency? How does it work out? Here's where Marx should have demonstrated the breakdown tendency, but he didn't do that explicitly. You know, it looks like the decisive answer is going to come right here, but it doesn't. And this is how doubt arose over Marx's theory of breakdown. Okay, so as I mentioned, Grossman used Otto Bauer's reproduction scheme as the first approximation to his full-fledged theory. But he argued that Bauer was wrong and Luxembourg was right. Okay, so Grossman said Bauer was wrong, Luxembourg was right about capital accumulation inevitably producing a purely economic tendency toward breakdown. Okay, but Grossman said that Luxembourg was right for the wrong reason. Selling additional output at home was not the problem. The problem is not whether an excess of commodities remains or not. The difficulty rather lies in the valorization of capital, the self-expansion uh, of value. Surplus value is not sufficient for accumulation to continue at the rate assumed, hence the catastrophe. And that's what he tries to prove. Okay, I got another uh, question from Van. Uh, the commonplace definition of breakdown is complete crash, catastrophic implosion, etc., implying the end of capitalism. Um, but is that Grossman's view, or is it rather a matter of downturn? Okay, Grossman. Grossman's theory includes the idea of a tendency to break down. And that tendency to break down is a catastro catastrophic um, implosion that's irreversible. Okay, but that is a tendency. What happens according to, to, to Grossman is well before that point, the capitalist revenue begins to decline because the capitalists are plowing so much of their profits into capital, they're accumulating. And so the revenue is declining. So before we reach the moment of breakdown, there are crises because the capitalists try to, you know, get out of the situation where the revenue is declining. Okay. So they slow down their investments, they try to squeeze the workers and so forth, the workers fight back. And so there's this tendency, it does not go away toward, you know, one single whole enveloping catastrophic breakdown, but the way in which it expresses itself, according to Grossman, is through these recurrent crises. Okay, and I got a question from uh, Seth. Was Bauer's reproduction scheme intended to follow Marx's expanded reproduction scheme, or is he intentionally proposing a new way to understand accumulation? Okay, although Bauer used the term model, he was not proposing a model any more than Marx was proposing a model. 
what Bauer was trying to do was to answer Luxembourg. The whole thing is in a review of Luxembourg's book, and he was trying to show that she was wrong when she claimed that the expanded output could not all be sold internally in a closed economy. So he wasn't trying to do exactly what Marx did. He took Marx's scheme of expanded reproduction, but because he was answering Luxembourg, and Luxembourg was saying, let's look at what happens when there's not only accumulation, you know, capital investment and growth, but there is technological progress. Okay. Bauer had to, to answer gross, to, to answer Luxembourg, he had to introduce technical progress, um, growth in means of production as against growth of employment. You know, so more means of production per worker. He had to introduce that in order to deal with the case that Luxembourg was using. So um, he adapted Marx's expanded reproduction scheme for the case in which Luxembourg was um, for the case that, that Luxembourg was dealing with. And following on that, did Bauer assume constant rate of surplus value in his scheme? Yes, I'll get to the exact assumptions of uh, Bauer's model uh, later. Uh, we're running short on time, so it might be the next uh, session. Um, okay, so um, what I think we should do now uh, is hear a word from uh, our sponsor, uh, and then I'll come back and see if there's more uh, questions, uh, comments in the chat, and then we'll turn to our discussants, and then we'll open up uh, the discussion to everybody. Mm -hmm. Marxist Humanist Initiative, or MHI, aims to contribute to the transformation of this capitalist world by projecting, developing, and concretizing the philosophy of Karl Marx and its further development in the Marxist humanism articulated by Raya Donayevskaya. The ongoing COVID-19 pandemic and today's many other social, political, and economic crises make this a moment to engage people in discussion of these ideas. In the U.S., we are faced with the threat of Trumpism triumphing in all-out authoritarianism extinguishing our right to carry on these discussions. Yet at the same moment, the multiracial movement for black lives has spread to every corner of the country and the world, launching a flood of activism and new ideas that deepen the concept of freedom. MHI is dedicated to the task of proving theoretically that an alternative to capitalism is possible. We are distinguished by our economic analyses in which we do not merely assert but demonstrate that the only opposite to the current world economic system is its abolition and replacement with one not based on the production of, quote, value, close quote. Because capitalism cannot be fundamentally reformed, attempts to reform it lead to an intensification of state capitalism, not to socialism. We are not a political party, nor are we trying to lead the masses who will form their own organization and whose emancipation must be their own act. But we have seen that spontaneous actions alone are insufficient to usher in a new society. We seek a new unity of philosophy and organization in which mass movements striving for freedom lay hold of Marx's oh. philosophy of revolution and recreate society on its basis. Our ideas and actions, as well as our structure and rules, are guided by the interests of working people and freedom movements of people of color, LGBTQ people, other minorities, women, youth, and all those around the world who are struggling for self-determination in order to freely develop their own human natures. We have no interests separate and apart from theirs. To this end, we open our website to the widest possible dialogue with people around the world. We intend to practice as well as espouse a two-way road between our organization and people outside it as essential to developing a single dialectic in the relationship of theory to practice. 
and as the way to assure the survival of Marxist humanism. Please join us. Okay, uh, thank you, Andrew Clark. Um, so now we're going to hear from our discussants. Uh, Alan Freeman actually has very long discussant comments. So some of the, uh, what he says, wants to say is going to be held over to the second class. Uh, Alan is the, formal, the former principal economist with the Greater London Authority. He's now a research affiliate of the uh, University of Manitoba with Radhika Desai. He's co-director of the Geopolitical Economy Research Group. He's co-editor of the Future of World Capitalism book series with Pluto Books and the Geopolitical Economy book series with Manchester University Press. He's an honorary life, vice president of the Association for Heterodox Economics and vice chair of the World Association for Political Economy a uh, former board member of the Video Pool Winnipeg and the Winnipeg uh, Symphony Orchestra. I'm having Alan go first because it's uh, two in the morning his time. Thank you very much, Andrew. Can I just make sure that everybody can hear me? Is uh, Andrew, Ann, are you, are you able to hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's good. If at any time something breaks off, I do apologize. The communication is a bit uncertain, but you'll have to shout. I won't see the chat because I'll be uh, looking at my text. So I prepared this text on the basis of a series of articles that Andrew had written previously. I don't think they contradict what Andrew has just told us, but they do refer to some elements in Andrew's critique of Grossman, which he has not yet touched on in this lecture. Uh, I start by thanking the Marxist Humanist Initiative for including me in a discussion which I think is actually at the cutting edge of the modern study of Marx's relevance to the state of the world today. If I get a little bit of time, I'll refer to some of the initiatives which are taking place elsewhere that dovetail very well with this broadcast. I want to go back to the origins of this debate in the temporal single system interpretation school which includes certainly Andrew and myself and many of those present here, the founders of that rightly focused on refuting unrelenting attacks on Marx's value theory by scholars that we term Marxists without Marx. And that by, by the early 1990s, these had effectively suppressed Marx's actual contribution. They claimed his explanation for the observed long falls in the profit rates and his account of the relation between price and value were logically contradictory. So therefore, you shouldn't pay any attention to Marx. You should pay attention to them and do Marxism without Marx. The result was a prolonged battle that we can pithily describe as a volume three debate. However, the main lines of this argument, while it's not been agreed by the, 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 the people whose arguments have been refuted, they never do agree, they are now clear, they're in the public domain. A second wave of debate opened in 2008, and that is what I think is the importance of this discussion. And this surfaced around allegations, in my view, that Marx had no crisis theory. These arose because the crash of 2008 was too serious to be ignored. And actually, it posed a big problem for the Marxists without Marx, because they interpreted Marx as an equilibrium theory, a theory in which the economy reproduces itself perfectly in every period. Such a theory cannot contain a crisis theory, because it starts from the assumption that capitalism reproduces perfectly. It cannot logically produce the conclusion that capitalism does not reproduce perfectly. If its advocates had been honest, they would have accepted that the fault lay in their own theories, which they presented wrongly as Marx's. In this context, Marx's own theory of capitalism reproduction comes to the fore. And for that reason, I'm calling this a volume two debate. So I will focus on the wider context of this debate. Now, the seminar, um, I do beg your pardon. 
Yeah. The seminar and Andrew's attention that has given to it is as timely as it is welcome. The new wave of interest is spearheaded by writers such as Guido De Marco, and they attend, they focus understanding on the fundamental issue that is raised by Marx in volume two, namely, how does capitalism reproduce itself? And there's no, there's no doubt that Marx was interested in this question. The issue is whether that was a breakdown theory or whether he was interested in something else. I think he was interested in how capitalism actually could work. Now, the difficulty with all Marxism without Marx theories is that they start from a doctrinal principle that capitalism reproduces perfectly. This assumes something that doesn't happen. And so it's not surprising they cannot explain what actually doesn't happen. The result of that is they attribute capitalism's problems always to some cause exogenous to capitalism. You can witness the new school, quote, unquote, explanations for the falling profit rate as an outcome of capitalist behavior, the theory of social structures of accumulation, the presentation of financialization as if it were a policy choice, or most scandalous, in my opinion, Duminal and Levy's announcement only four years after proclaiming the triumph of neoliberalism, that neoliberalism produced the crisis of 2008. So they all attribute capitalism's difficulties to its political superstructure. And I think there's a, a material reason for that. Ideologically, they cultivate respectability. They ingratiate their advocates with the very superstructure that we're talking about. And they do that by sanitizing Marx by re rephrasing it in such a way that the revolutionary content, that the revolutionary conclusion that superstructural reforms are insufficient to overcome capitalism's difficulties are removed. Now, the importance of the schemes of reproduction in this debate, in my opinion, is whatever their failures, they do not share this doctrinal principle. They're not actually temporal, they, they are actually temporal, not equilibrium uh, systems. I don't have the time and space to go into that. But that is, uh, for me, one of the big interests. In the language of TSA scholars, they are temporal or more precisely sequential theories. Now, this has a consequence because Borkiewicz, on whom all the Marxists without Marx base their theories, and his epigamies, they could convert simple reproduction into an equilibrium system. It's quite easy. You just say, well, the system just reproduces itself. Therefore, it's an equilibrium. You can't do that with the expanded reproduction counterpart. And this is a crack in the edifice of Marxism without Marx, which I think everybody should energetically leave her open. The reason is quite straightforward. An equilibrium treatment of accumulation and this is known from the results of the Straffer, von Neumann, Steedman schools, all the surplus school, they all admit that they have to suppose portions of production in department one and two remain fixed. But this cannot happen if there is accumulation because capital goods are produced by department one, which must therefore in some sense, at least at certain phases, grow faster than department one in any actual phase of accumulation. Indeed, this is what relative surplus value is all about. Now, Andrew has convincingly demonstrated, in my opinion, that the, um, the reproduction debate, the breakdown debate, which is the sort of inverse of the reproduction debate, has run into a dead end. So the question then arising is, in my opinion, similar to that we confronted in the volume three debate. Is this dead end a result of Marx's methods and assumption? Or does it arise from the misreading or inadequate reading of Marx's method and assumptions of the protagonists? And I believe that the second is the answer. That is Luxembourg, Bauer, uh, not, not, not so much Bauer, Luxembourg, Grossman, let's put it that way, fundamentally do not understand what Marx's own theory is. And I think a lot of the lecture that Marx has given today clarifies that. I'm going to deal with this by asking the following question. What is the function of the schemas in Marxist thinking? This is actually a difficult question to answer because volume two was actually put together from manuscripts written at vastly different points in time. And Engels makes this very clear in the introduction. Nevertheless, I do believe that the, 
the mere fact of saying that there should be a volume two, and in a sense, you know, uh, delegating at least spiritually to Engels the task of editing those schemas, demonstrates clearly that volume two has a definite function. And of course, you know, there are all, all sorts of general ideas about this. Uh, I don't want to go into them. I just want to look at the function of the schemas themselves. And I'm going to start with a critique that Andrew makes in his written work on the question, not so much in this presentation, the critique of fatalism. And I would even go further than the critique that you'll find of the fatalism of Grossman's followers and of Grossman in the, the written work of Andrew on this question before this debate. And I think at the root of all this is a confusion of possibility with necessity. I would urge you to read the introduction to late capitalism where Ernest Mandel assesses the breakdown debate and he puts it very well. The basic point he makes is that Marx's purpose was to establish the possibility that capitalism could reproduce itself. This is not a minor question because the theory of value, which is elaborated in volume one, dem it, it talks about a system in which there is no conscious coordination. It's not, it's not an assumption of value. You don't need that assumption in order to deduce value. Indeed, that's where the Marxists without Marx go wrong. You don't need to assume that capitalism reproduces itself to deduce that value is, exists because the theory of value arises from the commodity relation. So all equilibrium theories, and these start with Say's law, with Proudhon's concept of proportions. If you haven't read Marx's critique of Proudhon, you should. Uh, then general equilibrium, Valras, all Marxism without Marx, they're all the same. They all start from the proposition that capitalism must necessarily reproduce itself perfectly. And the reason was actually given in a somewhat horrified article that Gary Bon Jovi wrote in RIPE some while ago, that value is not determined unless one assumes this. This is a very peculiar concept of determination, but it essentially says if society doesn't reproduce itself so perfectly, value cannot exist. Logically, they mistook the conclusion of Marx for the premise of Marx. Actually, perfect reproduction is a special case of a normal mode of existence of capitalism, which is normally not in equilibrium. So the numbers in the schemas are averages of a process in which capital actually constantly migrates from one site to another in search of the highest possible profit rate, as Andrew has touched on. So their function for Marx of the theories of reproduction, in my opinion, is to assume that the cons is, is actually to demonstrate the opposite of how it's been used is to show that the assumption of equilibrium, perfect reproduction, is not theoretically necessary. But possibility is not necessity. Marx nowhere claims that simple reproduction is how capitalism e actually proceeds, nor does he claim that uh, expanded reproduction is this. To the contrary, volume three, which inquires into the actual course of capital, accumulation can be considered, I would argue, a dialectical inversion of the possibility theory in volume two. It investigates precisely why, under well-defined circumstances, the possibility of reproduction is not realized. If Marx, assumption, if Marx had assumed that the reproduction schemas contained everything you need to investigate capitalism's contradictions, why write volume three? The schemas would contain all the contradictions in and of itself. And that's why I think that this principal difficulty I find with the whole breakdown problematic, starting with Luxembourg, who very rarely says anything about volume three or the rate of profit or competition, which is a very important fact, a very important part of the process by which the actual difficulties of capitalism come into existence. So the breakdown thesis reduced to its essence is that the reproduction of capital itself is the source of capital's contradictions, not the effects of this on the reproduction process of the, the contradictions analyzed in volume three. And in this sense, Grossman deepens the original difficulties of Luxembourg's, which, which digs a pit into which his followers fall. Now, both these are variants of what I call positivism. Which I criticized in an early article in Research in Political Economy. 
This forms the basis not only of neoclassical theory, but has had a profound influence on the Marxist movement. To take just one example, it informs LaSalle's iron law of wages, which was the dominant theory of the social democracy long before Bernstein, which basically asserted that the conscious action of workers could do nothing to overcome the fall in the real wage as a result of capitalist accumulation. It also affirms much of the, what I would call mechanical determinism of Stalin era Marxism. The basic notion of positivism, which is due to the French uh, philosopher Le Comte and, and, and also was very adopted by the famous astronomer Laplace, is that human destiny is governed like the stars, like the heavens, by natural laws. And these are external to conscious human action. You can even see that in the Brazilian flag, which has the stars up above. Progress is in the heavens. Humans must simply bow down to these laws. So positivism is not merely deleterious, but profoundly anti-human because it denies the role of conscious human action in deciding the fate of humanity, the empowerment of the, of the working class that An uh, Andrew referred to, that the conscious taking into their hands as the liberatory task of their own destiny. So fatalism isn't just a minor theoretical definition, it's potentially, although some, some fatalists are very nice people, it's potentially a very dangerous department from a political theory in which human self-liberation plays a role. This leads me to a key distinction which Andrew rightly introduced and to our response to Heinrich. Heinrich was probably the first of the Marx does not have a crisis theory people, though he didn't put it in a, a volume two way, but he, he introduced this notion into the discussion. And it's uh, the key point that Andrew makes, which he's also made here, is the distinction, necessary distinction between explanation and prediction. Marx does not say the rate of profit must necessarily fall. He offers an explanation of when it does, why it does. So the humanist core of this is that it equips humans with the understanding they need in order to act. That's the function of theory to liberate humans by allowing them to act on their own behalf. So I want to discuss the following for discussion, suggest the following for discussion in conclusion, and we'll come to that, I hope, in the second part. What do the schemas of reproduction, Marxist schemas of reproduction, actually contribute to our understanding of capitalism? And the answer I'm going to give is they contribute enormous amounts. Otherwise, Marx wouldn't have seen it necessary to write volume two and Engels would not have put the enormous amount of work he did put into assembling Marx's very diverse manuscripts into a coherent whole, guided by what he understood, in my opinion, correctly to be Marx's own theory. However, this cannot be done on the basis established in the luxembourg bukharin grossman debate. So the issue is not which contradiction which contradictions of capitalism can be found in the schemas of reproduction, but how reproduction is affected by the contradictions arising from accumulation. Are the schemas suited to this purpose? What are their limitations? Do such limitations arise from Marx's approach? I don't think they do. Or from their subsequent treatment? Can they, if there are limitations, be overcome? And if they can be overcome, which I believe they can, can they be overcome within Marxist framework, which I also believe they can. I believe that recent scholarship, particularly that is dealing with turnover time and fixed capital, on which Guido De Marco and others who are not mentioned but who have contributed to this debate about turn, turnover time, allow us to give a qualified yes to this last question. Once again, thank you for this excellent opportunity for a very timely discussion. Thank you very much, Alan. Uh, if you want to hang on, fine. If you want to get some rest, uh, definitely understand that. Uh, we'll now hear from our other uh, discussant, Esteban Mora, who I don't think has video. Um, in any case, you'll hear him. He's a graduate student in collective communication science at the Universidad de Costa Rica, where he also studied political economy. Uh, he writes on Marxist economics at Marx rlsigla.blogspot.com. He's the author of a trilogy of books on cultural economics and cultural studies. 
uh, written from a Marxist perspective. He's written several other works on economics, semiotics, and mathematics. Uh, at the Review of African Political Economy, he contributes to the discussion of the debate between David Harvey and John Smith, and he frequently contributes to the left to the leftist outlet Intervención y Coyuntura, located in Mexico. Uh, and in addition, Esteban has worked as a member of an audiovisual production collective, collaborated on a university radio show, and on a weekly music column at Seminario Universidad from the Universidad de Costa Rica. And he's been a producer of image, music, and text. Uh, and he is also a discussant. So take it away, uh, Esteban. Thank you so much. Uh, cheers to all. I'm speaking to you from Costa Rica, Central America. And it's and I'm so glad to be here. And thank you much, I, for the invitation and all the participants for coming. Uh, my, I just have five small points, five small points to, to, to point out. Um, the, the first one uh, is that this discussion is not a, a scholastic discussion at all. But the, it is really important for us here in, in peripheral societies, as much as advanced societies and economies, because it's what we're seeing from our eyes, right? And we're seeing a contraction of expanded reproduction, a contraction. If you see the world's figures for for gross capital formation, you'll see them falling or a tendency to fall historically in the last decades. And so we're watching, it, it is what is in front of us. It's, it's not an scholastic abstract thing, but it's, it's, it pertains to all, right? And the first point I would like to make is that, well, I, I like to point out that Grossman uses a specific and a different type of measure for the accumulation rate. We'll see soon why I'm pointing this out. Uh, he uses C plus B divided into S instead of C plus B divided into total capital, right? Um, this is interesting to me because, especially in, in the sense of uh, Andrew Kleiman's uh, proposal and reading of it, because this means that even if you use, we use another measure for accumulation, C plus B divided into S instead of C plus B divided into total capital, we still get the same problem. So we arrive at a, at a so-called deficit, as Grossman calls it, in accumulation, and accumulation starts to decrease or recede, right? So this means to me that um, this, per, this confirms uh, Andrew Kleinman's reading because um, where we use one formula or the other, we still get the same problem with, with decreased reproduction. I actually thought of, a, of, a, of a, an hypothetical accumulation rate, a different one, like using a 15% share of S of surplus value as, 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 as the extra capital invested for, for the accumulation to, to, to happen. And I find out that the same problem arises. The accumulation starts decreasing and uh, but there's no deficit in this, in this, if we look at it this way. Instead of C plus B divided into S, if we use a 50%, 15% share of S as C plus B, as um, this accumulation grows, then it starts decreasing, but it never reaches a breakdown. There's no deficit. So we could produce some reproduction schemes and models even following Grossman's uh, uh, conditions where there's no break. And I think this is important in, in order to, to show that Kleiman's, uh, Andrew Kleiman's criticism is correct. This will be the first point. There's, these are very simple points. Uh, um, let's see. The other point I wish, wish to make is that if you're used to watching uh, statistics from different economies all around the world, like I'm, I do at least, I'm a nerd. And uh, I, we are used to watch negative accumulation rates. I mean, rates of accumulation, which go to the negative side. And we of course watch, for example, here in Costa Rica, there's a negative accumulation rate around 1980. 
we we see the 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 line the charts and the graphs and they all show a negative tendency of accumulation and there's a breakdown in 1980 or 1981 around that period just because of a negative accumulation rate there is in price uh, the the um, the economy continues to produce profit, continues to produce surplus value, and accumulation starts to grow again. So, uh, in light of what uh, we were saying about formulas, different formulas and different models having the same issue with this exogenous growth in, in, in constant and variable capital uh, as a condition made by Grossman in his model, uh, we find that there's no breakdown. So what is the breakdown, the, the, what is uh, uh, the finding made by Grossman? I mean, Grossman actually proves that organic composition does create a, a fall in the profit rate. But what is this breakdown then? If we can see right now the statistics for a bunch of economies with negative accumulation rates, and there's no breakdown in any of those economies. So what is it, right? Uh, uh, I think that the, there's the possibility and this is my third point, which I would like to affirm and, and, and propose to you as uh, some sort of, uh, I don't like to work with a hypothesis, but let's call it that way. And um, will be that what Grossman, what Henry Grossman finds as a deficit in accumulation, as a deficit in the extra capital invested on top of his already own capital, as, Klein, as Andrew Kleinman already exposed, is uh, basically the contracted reproduction proposed by man. This is a proposal I'm making to you to discuss as well, uh, for us to collectively um, deny, criticize, or affirm this. Either way, I'm not saying it is the case, I'm just proposing the possibility. Please, there's a difference, right? I'm not saying it's definitely like that, but it might be that this deficit that Grossman finds and that he interprets as a breakdown is only a diminishing or a, or a, or a receding or a smaller accumulation rate. So accumulation still happens, there's growth. Let's remember the, the definitions made by Andrew Kleinman just a, a few minutes before. Simple reproduction, there's no growth. Expanded reproduction, there is growth. And then this possibility, the third reproduction proposed by Mandel will be that it is expanded reproduction. There is a, an increasing rate of reproduction or accumulation, excuse me, but there's, but diminishing, which is different from no growth, but it's no growth either. Right. So this will be my the third point. I will I will try to 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 propose and affirm to you guys for us to discuss or not. And then I agree with with what Alan Freeman said about the confusion between necessity and sufficiency. I would call it. I think there's a difference between. I mean, the comparative charts uh, shown by shown uh, by Andrew Kleiman a few minutes ago show that Marx thinks of the profit rate, whether it's increasing or decreasing, as a more fluctuating movement where profit rates can fall and no crisis to happen, which means crises are not sufficient but necessary. Maybe this has to do with what Alan Freeman said about the confusion between sufficiency and necessity. And, and, and I will agree, right? Uh, uh, yeah, as the profit rate is, is just a necessary condition, the fall in the profit rate. But as we see in the chart displayed by Andrew Kleiman, um, there's no, there, there's a, some, it's a more dialectical, mobile, flexible uh, model in, in, in the eyes of Marx compared to this exponential growth, automatic, almost exogenous 
uh, uh, um, proposed by Grossman. That will be the comments. And I think uh, it's 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 important that once again, those will be my comments. Those are my comments. It's important that we can reproduce a model S plus, uh, C plus B as shares of S and the fact that they will stop uh, accumulation, but they will create a contracted reproduction. That's true, but not a breakdown. And it's interesting because whether we use any of these measures for accumulation rates to measure accumulation rates, the problem persists, which gives credence to Andrew Kleiman's interpretation. It's not uh, something in reproduction itself, but the exogenous character of, uh, of, of constant capital growth and variable capitals growth. Since it happens with any other formula we use, the, for the, the problem keeps happening, the problem is not there. The problem is with this, these variables. And uh, I wish to say that uh, I think it's, once again, not an scholastic discussion at all, not an abstract discussion at all, but that it's very pertinent to what's happening in the world because the we're seeing this. Well, Michael Roberts the other day reported on on productivity growth on on emerging economies, for example. What do I mean by this? Without getting into the whole imperialism debate, I think the breakdown tendency or the breakdown point of view uh, uh, proposed by Grossman and, and his followers makes it look like there are only liabilities and only externalities for the world market when the rate of profit falls or when there are downturns in accumulation or when there are crises. When in reality, as we are witnessing today with these uh, competitors against advanced countries trying to be aspiring imperialists, etc., uh, we see that the times where there's a fall in profit rate, in the profit rate, or there's a fall in the accumulation rate, etc., are also beneficial for some economies. They are not an absolute. That's what I mean. An absolute breakdown. There's no absolute externalities. There are no absolute. There are no absolute liabilities for all, like uh, an absolute depression or everything. But profit continues to be made. Surplus value continues to be made. Negative accumulation can be turned into positive. Negative accumulation doesn't mean a breakdown. Doesn't imply or, or any any breakdown sufficiently. And uh, that is what we're seeing. We're seeing that, that the fall in the profit rate since the late 60s or early 70s is producing uh, the, the possibility for emerging countries to compete historically in a very very wide and um, historical uh, reading uh, precisely because of this contraction not because they are having an expansion not because they're having a a a boom but because con uh, reproduction is contracting itself but this at, at, at the same time produces some benefits Depending on competition and, and the rest, that will be my my the points I would like to discuss and propose to you. Thank you so much for the invitation. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you very much, Esteban. Uh, <clears throat> so now, I mean, is the time for uh, all participants to comment. Uh, or ask questions about uh, my presentation, uh, ask comments, uh, make comments, ask questions about the discussants' comments, uh, as well as you know Grossman's theory, uh, Luxembourg's theory, Marx's crisis theory, and so forth. Uh, there have been a couple of things in the chat, a couple of questions and one comment, so I want to turn to them first. Uh, we've got from uh, Teresa H. Two questions of clarifying Luxembourg's rejection of Marx and Bauer. How could Luxembourg find the idea that capitalists would buy and sell to each other ludicrous? 
Well, it's not as stupid as, as thinking that they don't buy and sell to each other. The idea is what she found ludicrous is that they increasingly buy from and sell to each other. The idea is that Luxembourg had, Paul Sweezy, all the other consumptionists had, that production is ultimately production for people, consumption. So, yeah, you can produce more means of production, but ultimately only insofar as you're going to have more consumer goods. So the idea is, yeah, you you know, you mine iron and it becomes steel and the steel is used to produce cars. And guess what? People drive cars. So ultimately, all even under capitalism, all production is ultimately for the purpose of consumption. Okay, that's their view. I, I don't think it's right and so forth. I, I can't go into it now. I, I would refer you to, among other sources, uh, the critique of Luxembourg in chapter four of Raya Donetskaya's book on Rosa Luxemburg, Rosa Luxemburg, Rosa Liberation of Marxist Philosophy of Revolution. I also wrote about this issue in chapter eight and a bit in chapter nine of my book, uh, The Failure of Capitalist Production. Uh, so the other thing is, she, Teresa asks, wouldn't this buying and selling a means of production between capitalists account for a lot, if not most, of economic activity? Uh, I'm going to share my screen once more. I prepared a slide for next time. I was using this in a different context, but it's relevant now. So share my screen. Okay, this is the constant uh, circulate, circulating constant capital as a percentage of the total price of output in the U.S. for, uh, what is it, 75 years. And it basically fluctuates all the time, somewhere between 50 and 55% of the total price, what's called gross output uh, in the national accounts. So that's already more than half. That's what are called intermediate inputs, you know, buying and selling between capitalists uh, and depreciation uh, of fixed capital. And on top of that, there's a lot of things that are not either depreciation of fixed capital or intermediate inputs that are businesses buying from and selling to each other. Lots of business services, accountancy, legal services, um, all, all, all kinds of things like that, um, you know, security services. Um, and so, you know, you were to, if you were to add that in, I don't know how much it would be, but it would be obviously well more than, than half of the total price of output. That's not exactly what Teresa asked, but it, it helps to answer that question. Um, and then we've got a comment from Ravi. Uh, you can see from the presentation so far why, pe why people take sides in debates on the basis of who was saying it rather than what they say. Uh, the idea that Varga, Stalinist representative, would more accurately convey what Marx said on absolute overaccumulation than Grossman who was trying to rescue the revolutionary core of Marx's crisis theory uh, is, is a great irony. Uh, I mean, yeah, this this debate does not break down on, uh, you know, the normal political lines. You know, you had Kautsky, you got Lenin, you know, uh, Lenin says Kautsky got it right, Bernstein is wrong, uh, Grossman, you know, supposedly a revolutionary, he was pro-Stalin, he said that, uh, you know, um, Bernstein was, was right about this, you know, purely economic breakdown being the issue, uh, and that Marx, you know, did have a breakdown theory, you know, there's Luxembourg in there, this is a debate that's kind of orthogonal 
to a lot of the questions in um, in, in politics. Uh, Alan has written in crises for Marx play, I think, a role in accumulation and reproduction, which is that they act to devalue capital and restore the profit rate. However, two currents emerge from this. Schumpeter, who lauds Marx as the discoverer of, cy as the discoverer of cycles, but argues that Marx's theory actually proves capitalism can always restore itself. The other is long wave theory, which says the restoration is incomplete and so things get worse and worse. I think Marx did not take this fatalist view, but definitely argues that the restoration is incomplete, so the crises get worse and worse. Uh, I think Esteban said that he agreed with that. Um, my own view is that um, the context, Marx did say we should expect the crises to get worse and worse. I think the context of that was different. Uh, I, I, you know, I had to go back into the text and look, but I think it had to do more with the rhythms of um, the accumulation process uh, and the, the the bringing of people into um, capitalist production and, and so forth. I, but I don't remember the context. But I. I don't remember certainly this idea of the restoration being incomplete. Uh, that is something I don't remember. Okay, Brendan, my co-host on Radio Free Humanity has written, Grossman's model relies on restrictive assumptions that lead to a state of overaccumulation. At the same time, underconsumptionist theories also lead to a theory of overaccumulation. Is there an apparent phenomenon that appears as overaccumulation that both theories are trying to explain theoretically? Um, I think so. And that is that in every crisis, you have overproduction and you have overaccumulation. That's in retrospect, okay? Uh, in other words, the, the capitalists are investing, they're producing, and you know, at some going rate, and everything's fine until investment demand, maybe occasionally consumption demand drop. Okay, once you get that drop in demand, then in retrospect, they've accumulated too much, they've produced too much. So there is a phenomenon, and you know, Mark said this against uh, Adam Smith, there, are, there is this periodic overproduction, overaccumulation. Okay, there, there are these temporary crises, um, but they're temporary, but they're permanent in the sense that they, they keep recurring. Uh, but that, but that's the phenomenon. What the underconsumptionists, I think, do, and 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 and, and Grossman did, and I think they're both wrong on this account, is to revert back to the the, the Smithian, you know, long run. This is zero growth breakdown scenario, whatever it is, and 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 to deny that the crises are fully restorative uh, and allow capital accumulation to to resume once again. Uh, and then Alan has come in and said, I think Marx's concern was the historical evolution of capitalism, not breakdown as such. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I mean, I don't think there's a theory of breakdown in Marx, and I don't think that the passage that the, the, the people point to, you know, uh, you get the centralization of capital, you got the socialization of labor, you know, they're incompatible with this capital shell, the expropriated and expropriated. That, that's not an economic breakdown, or it's not a purely economic breakdown either. So I, I think that the, the people are grasping at straws with respect to that. Um, okay, Esteban, if you can see the chat, there's a question for you. Is negative accumulation sometimes reasonable in terms of net present value, taking the loss to pay down debts and have larger profits in the future? 
Are there social political conditions that correlate with a national economy in overaccumulation? And he's curious if state capitalist economies in particular accommodate overaccumulation and internalized crises. And relatedly, there's another question for you from Stephanie. Please explain or define negative accumulation. And Esteban, if you're there, you need to unmute. Thank you. Yeah, well, the negative rate of accumulation will be just uh, a process of accumulation which grows, still grows, but at a smaller pace or they're in a decreasing way. It could be even, it could happen even with, with positive uh, numbers. It doesn't need to be negative to be a smaller or decreasing accumulation. It can be simply uh, uh, decreasing the rate or the decreased rate. And yes, there's, there's a possibility that this could be used to augment or at least trying to balance out uh, the profit rate. Yeah, so they could be, this could be used as, as a form to pay debts and, and, and the rest, as you point out in the question. Yes, it can, it can be done for that. I mean, like here in Central America, for example, we are producing on a contracted form as well. And this produces a, a, an upheaval of, of profits, or at least a, a, a stopping of their decreasing. So that would be my my answer. Yeah, yeah, it could be uh, it could be seized for for continuing production, capitalist production in this anemic and disastrous way. Yeah. I, I have a question, but I'm a bit confused by your answer. Like in the Great Depression in the United States, there was disaccumulation, a negative rate of accumulation. Yeah. Okay. In other words, they, the capitalists were not investing to such an extent they weren't even fully replacing their capital. Yeah, like okay. on, touching on simple reproduction. Yeah, there was less than simple reproduction. Yeah. Okay, they, they, they were destroying capital. But then you said that it would be negative accumulation if they were continuing to accumulate, but at a slower rate. A negative that's rate. a negative growth. That, 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 it's a, that, that's the positive accumulation. No? Yeah, I mean like, yeah, like even with, you could have a decreasing rate of accumulation even with positive rate of accumulation. You don't need it to be negative. Okay, we've got, uh, Michael has come in. Is it roughly correct to say that Grossman's reasoning essentially boils down to something physical like this? It's like a pot full of soap that's X, the whole physical product. With a spoon, an amount of soap is taken out, that's A, okay. This stuff with X and A, it's not there in Grossman at all. He tries to work purely with value in the model. And then to say some things about use value or physical quantities in his chapter three, but he never does that explicitly. That is me, but I'm not imposing on Grossman. Okay, I'm not just importing it. What, what Bauer does and what Grossman do, does in the model, in the, the scheme of reproduction is assume that the per that the value per unit of the commodity or the price per unit of the commodity is constant once that is the case i mean you could basically say the price or the value is one and at that point all of the value quantities are also physical quantities if you've got essentially a one sector model like grossman does so the idea is implicit in the scheme are physical quantities by virtue of the fact that the price or value per unit is held constant. So Grossman's reasoning is always in terms of value. 
He says the constant capital grows at 10% a year. He says the uh, variable capital the surplus value grow at 10% a year. Okay, the upshot of that, however, is that, okay, the means of production grow at 10%. The uh, amount of workers grows at 10%, but the physical amount of output grows at less than 10%. So it does not grow as fast as the volume of means of production. So you got the, you know more and more materials and machines, they're growing at 10%, but the production of materials and machines and everything else is not growing that fast. Hello, you're gonna have a breakdown. That's the cause of the breakdown. Okay, so let me continue with this. With the spoon and amount of soap is taken out, that's A, the means of production. Grossman defines pot soap gross, right? Okay. Right. You got the, the, the growth just right. I don't think Grossman was aware of this or Bauer was aware of this, that their assumptions in effect, implicitly constrain the growth of physical production, physical output, so that it grows less rapidly than means of production increase. I don't think they were aware of that at all. Okay, but it, it, it is a, it's a necessary consequence of the model once you say that the value of the commodity is constant, as uh, Grossman did, Taking over what, what Bauer did before in chapter three, uh, Grossman relaxes that assumption. Okay, so Michael, I think, got the exactly what's going on in terms of the, the cause of breakdown right. Um, that's what I'm saying, uh, that what I tried to disclose, uh, I think it's right, but it's not explicitly there in Bauer. It's not explicitly there in Grossman, and I don't think they were even aware of it. Uh, Nick Potts, who will be discussing in the second class, along with um, Sebastian, who is uh, Hernandez, who is also uh, on today's call. Okay, Esteban says that negative accumulation is not what he meant. He's talking about negative rate of accumulation. Negative accumulation would be, right, I think there's a bit of a confusion there. Uh, but it's just a terminological uh, issue. You mean a slowdown in the rate of accumulation. You mean that more capital is accumulated, but the rate at which capital is being accumulated is less than before. I think that's what you mean. I'm, I'm a bit I'm a bit confused here. Uh, Simon says thank you, thank you. Right, exactly. Okay, there's a breakdown. Yeah. Okay. Um, so let me see. Is there anything more? I did not get obviously through everything that I wanted to get through today. Um, we have some time in the second class. Um, there, there was just a lot of preliminary, you know, history and, and, and stuff to cover. What I want to do next time is very briefly go through all the major assumptions in Bauer's model, uh, how they are the same as Marx or different from Marx, then give a really short primer on the growth rate mathematics, and then move into uh, Grossman's model, uh, major properties of it, and then uh, how Grossman tries to integrate all of this into his theory. Let me see if there's any more comments or questions. Okay. Um, you can always, by the way, write to me. Uh, you can write to MHI. That's one easy way. If you don't have my email address, write write to me in the next, you know, couple of weeks to try to clarify things that are not yet clear. Um, 
and I will try to prepare study questions uh, for the next class. I'll carry over some of the ones before from before, but definitely, definitely pay attention to the bonus trick question number 10, because it's the key to everything. And Tom O'Brien says he's looking forward to part two. Yay. Um, okay, so thank you to everyone and I'll see you all in a couple of weeks. And thanks very much to uh, Gabriel Donnelly and to Sky. And they are our technical people today. See you in a couple of weeks.